Hello, everybody. I'm Kate Lawrence. I'm the CEO and founder of Black Accelerate. We've been investing in the Web3 space since 2018. We have 25 investments. We've got three unicorns uh, for two exits. Uh, but as a founding team, we've been investing since 2013. We've got the two rounds of Coinbase, Australian Bank, White Paper, we've worked at a price, and a few other kind of important projects. Uh, my co founder was on the board of the first smart contract platform called MasterCoin. Most of you might not have heard of it, but I was actually started here in Seattle. It was a predecessor to Ethereum. Uh, Vitalik Buterin, who is the founder of Ethereum, was contributing to MasterCoin. And uh, it was the first uh, version of what smart contracts were to become um, many years later. Uh, personally, I uh, spent 10 years at Gartner. And part of the reason I appreciate the 361 community it actually reminds me of a lot of Gartner types of conferences. You, you know, uh, I don't. The chairman of Harris. Next is involved with us. Okay. What do you like about Gartner? What do you like about us? Well, um, Gartner has built a brand to be a unbiased truth provider, if you will, to the CIOs of Fortune 500 companies. It's really not trying to sell anything. It's just there to help. Um, obviously, the public traded company, so it has revenues and it's selling research. But the fund of the and stuff. <laughs> we 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 set we set knowledge and forward. That's right. So that's that's the that's that's what I see as a parallel. Um, and I really found this gathering helpful in that sense. Personally, my background and, and the reason I've gotten into this space, I was actually talking to Michael. Where's Michael? Michael's back. He asked me yesterday. Oh, you're still doing blockchain. It's still unpopular right now, right? And I was doing blockchain five years ago. I'm doing blockchain today. And I'll talk to you in five years and I'm still going to be doing blockchain. I can guarantee you that because the fundamental belief I have is that uh, blockchain is going to solve the trust problem that we have in a society. And my trust problem comes from the way I was um, brought up. I was born and raised in the Soviet Union. I didn't know you at the time, but I was also in Moscow. And um, my mother, who was an aerospace engineer, was let go uh, because of the Soviet Union collapse, and she had to go borrow money, 100% interest from in 91. She would go bankrupt because of the 3,000% inflation between 91 and 92, plus 100% interest rate, then go again, start again, go borrow money, and then she would not trust the bank to move money from Moscow to St. Petersburg to her vendors. She would strap cash to herself and travel 13 hours on the train to deliver a payment to her partners. And that is, a, you know, for those of you who are from here, this might not be an acute example of trust, but for, for a lot of people outside of the United States, that's a huge, trust is a huge problem. And I think you can fast forward 30 years later today and say, oh, everything's great. But the reality is we live in the bear market of trust. We don't trust our government, we don't trust our education, we don't trust our media, we don't trust each other. So the solution in my mind is blockchain, maybe not to all the problems that I listed, but at least some of them. So that's been we're all gonna come to that vision, the model. Well, as far as that, I mean, follow that story. <laughs> um, I'm Charlie Liu. Um, I'll start with the background. Um, I'm a computational biologist, computer scientist, but applied to biology in, um, in my background. And I've done large scale analytic systems that everybody calls AI now. But <laughs> back in the day, we didn't, we didn't call any of this stuff AI. I've implemented large scale systems. Um, on the human genome, across multiple areas of the biotech sphere, all the way to pharmaceutical, and then took that out into logistics, transportation, and now to the venture capital space. Um, so, um, uh, uh, you know, I don't, I'm not very good at sort of <laughs> giving a background on myself. Kate is actually better at talking about me than I <laughs> <laughs> Charlie's the fact that she just sold her company that was doing $400 million in revenues for what a billion plus valuation um, American Eagle was to acquire. That company went from zero to 400 million in less than 10 months, which is, I think, beating the records. 
100 million in the 10 months, which is, I think, beating the records of Slack and some of those highest growth technology companies out there. I got a moderate part now. You are going to definitely. <laughs> Um, yeah, so I mean, I, I'm excited about the the sort of power of big data and what we can do with it and, and, and applying things like AI and blockchain onto the data sets that we do have. There's a lot of challenges in acquiring data, um, but, but that's something that I, I personally know how to solve. I run some of the largest uh, data repositories in the world around any number of things, genomics, you know, complex diseases, and um, and we're, I'm hoping to build one for the venture space. So two directions that are hard to top, um, so I'll try it, but I'm in Rob and I'm also a CIO uh, of Chain and Capital Management. We run blockchain, cryptocurrency, Web3, whatever you want to call it, uh, hedge funds and funds. Very specialized, unique thing. Um, and uh, our flagship fund is also invested since 2018 and was the top performing small uh, crypto fund for the last three years, according to Hedgeweed, which we've got because it's a really bullish uh, profit cycle. And also, if they're really bearish, nobody wants to talk to the cycle. So, we really ride ourselves in that. Um, so, long term view, we got a really stage venture, but in a really good hedge fund vehicle. Um, my background is as a different kind of CIO, I was chief information officer in New York State, the legislature before that. And, a GovTech entrepreneur in between helping other governments to do things um, based on a model that we created in New York State. And one did lead to the other. I got very good at building big centralized transaction management systems for governments that cost a lot of money and took a lot of time to build. And I got really frustrated with how difficult it was to do that as cheaply and as efficiently and with the outcome being as impactful as I thought it ought to be when it's funded by our tax dollars in particular. And I do believe that decentralizing technologies are a really important complement, blockchain is a very important complement to the way that we build big centralized databases and interfaces to those databases. And so, long term conviction that that technology will, will matter. Um, one last thing I'm seeing to say is I do think it's interesting, like I said, that the only two blockchain investors in here, as far as I'm aware, are on the data and AI panel. And I think that tells you something. I think there's a little bit of a sort of existential psychological crisis right now in the blockchain tech industry. I, like Kate, though, have deep conviction that it is actually really the next pillar use case for crypto and blockchain tech is helping AI and data work for us and not against us in a, what I call an institutional world. Right, the institutions that have a hard time dealing with this in reality and I think blockchain is not possible. But now let's say to you, so what, we're not talking about excites you about one investment, but what scares you that the so, I mean, trust, it said, it said absolutely trust. I have a hard time trusting a lot of things that I once trusted that are very, nothing to do with AI per se, but I think are impacted actually by the underappreciated impacts that AI has already been having on our society, like our government and democracy and my bank and all these things. But that, what is the question? That, that, that is, that you're excited about the industry development, but what scares you about? The industry and the roadmap of the industry. Obviously, you, you, you see solutions. Yeah, so I, I think it's going to be difficult to trust. I think it's going to be difficult for me to authenticate myself in a way that I can prove is uniquely me, and that therefore my counterparties are going to be able to also, in a way that is like functional for me and not frustrating and not slow and not error prone, uh, interact and transact with me. I think a lot of this rolls up to the ability to transact. And I think it's getting harder, not easier to transact at a time when it's going to be more and more important to be able to transact efficiently and with trust. And by efficiently, I mean lower fees, I mean across institutions and geographies, you know, uh, conscious of but not not for all of my regulation, uh, particularly regulation in AI is going to be a big friction point that may be really off angle, is what I think ought to be done. So it's that kind of stuff that's going to be the loss of our ability really to transact in a pragmatic way and the ways that we may and intentionally as a society get that more wrong than otherwise needs to be through displaced regulation. I, I'm going to answer that um, broadly and narrowly. Uh, so broadly, I mean, I think this is the same thing, right? There's a lot of generative data that's not true anymore and it's sort of sort of leading into 
real data that's going to make it really hard to action on the data that's data sets that are available. That's one of the scary things that it, you know, I think more practically how that translates to people's everyday lives is that we will no longer be able to see footage of something and know whether or not that's true or not. There's no way back to the whole trust and authentication issues. There's no way in uh, just maybe in a year and you wouldn't be able to watch something and say, well, that's that's definitely happened or no, that definitely didn't happen because there's it's gotten so good in I mean, I don't know if you guys seen the latest, but like MIT has put together some video that looks perfectly real and it's full. So, um, so that that is going to sort of leak into the the model, and now we will be able to tell if something that showed up on your, you know, YouTube feed is actually something that happened. You know, there's a bombing. Did you know that that really happened, or were you there? Do you know? How do you know? Like, there's no way to know. So it's it's really that's the broad sort of scary thing, and then the more narrow scary thing is now all of this data is supposed to be just floating around, and if you have guys like Google and Microsoft following the internet for all of this, it's going to leak into real analysis with large, with, you know, open AI, whatever they eventually call it. So that's going to have impact within industries, right? Even, even in genomics, where I have the most experience in, that's starting, there's going to be fake scene sequences that's going to be in And that's going to change how we look at, um, you know, disease progressions or how we elucidate complex diseases. And that's going to change how we develop pharmaceuticals. So there's just like a lot of implications specifically in each of these spaces around well, I think that to sum up everything um, that was said, maybe in a slightly different way, what I'm scared of is I'm scared of centralization. <laughs> and um, I think centralization is a double-edged sword because on the one hand, centralization is what gives us efficiencies. If something is centralized, you can run it faster, you can you know, get the output faster, and that's the way that our systems have, built, have been built. But centralization without checks and balances is very, very scary. I personally lived through centralization in my old state of Russia. And if you follow the news, what's happening now, that's the outcome of that centralized decision making that doesn't get challenged by um, other authorities. And um, though we can assume that actors in the US who are behind AI initiatives have good intentions. I am scared of what could happen if those intentions are left unchecked. So um, do I think decentralization is the final answer? I think we need to decentralize everything. Absolutely not. I don't think that's within you know, our technological feasibility right now. We can't run algorithms in a decentralized manner and get the same results. But I think that there are some early signs of fragmentation that are happening where you can run certain um, algorithms on your, even on your phone. Um, there's segregation of, um, of data outputs. And, and the exciting part, if we were to get there, you can even incentivize and help individuals monetize on that data and all the algorithms uh, running on, on your phone. Yeah. I read that. Should I move on to what you're saying? But yes, and particularly if you're one from one girl, there's an example of many for life. And what excites me? Pickleball. Pickleball excites me. By the way, it was my first standpoint today, so thank you for educating me. I'm still hurting. <laughs> uh, but um, so let me, yeah, let me let me start on the macro. Um, I think outside of data and AI, I think we're in a very interesting point in time. And obviously, my purview, my view is, is I'm 100% focused on blockchain and I don't spend any time looking at my companies, but I'm seeing a certain inflection point in the world that I'm in, which I call the 1998 1999 the internet where we had 300 million users in the internet. It was the early 
you know, ideation of what could be possible. And everybody keep, was coming out and you know, saying everything would be bought and sold online. In reality, what do we buy and sell, uh, sell online in 99? Just books and DVDs. That's it. And then it took 10, 20 years for everything else to be bought and sold online. I see the same parallel in my world of blockchain where everybody said, we're going to tokenize everything. Everything will be on chain. Real estate, on chain. Funds, on chain. You know, money, JPEGs. In reality, what did we get? Just money and JPEGs. Everything else failed so far. Why did it fail? Because it's never going to be tokenized? No, because we didn't have the infrastructure to bring uh, groceries to the internet. We don't have the infrastructure today to bring other assets to the blockchain. So I think we have this infrastructure build-out phase that we're looking at for the next four years. That's number one. Number two, um, more related to data, I'm excited about the idea of data sovereignty. The idea of data sovereignty means you control your data and you're the only um, kind of entity that is able to monetize on that data if you wish to do so. Why is it important? Number one is privacy. Um, in between 2015 and today, there has been more than 1,800 privacy uh, data breaches, affecting more than 400 million people. But you could argue people don't care about it. They are not willing to pay for it. And I would agree with you. Everybody still uses Facebook, even though your data was breached um, a few years ago. But then number two is what is data and what is what is data in relation to assets? If you own a piece of land somewhere in Honduras, how do you know that you actually own that piece of land? Because there's a data entry in a centralized database in that government telling you and the rest of the world that you own this, this piece of land. If that data is compromised, you no longer own this piece of land. So that data sovereignty is what empowers you to actually own the assets that you thought you did. Um, and then there's other use cases there. And there are examples of there are examples of the data being in other countries where it gets hacked and you no longer own the land, and that happens actually quite a bit outside of the U.S. Um, so, so the ability to to well, actually, it does happen here too, but not that much. <laughs> Um, so yeah, so, so the exciting thing that Kate is talking about is, well, we can now secure all of that and we don't have to worry as much about that kind of issue, especially if we're going to invest in regions where the infrastructure isn't stable. Oh, so I guess it's passing. Um, so I, I'm generally, I mean, as a data geek, I'm generally just excited about data, period. Um, I mean, I'm definitely worried about the, the sort of authenticity of the data, but for the most part, um, whenever I leave the world of genomics where I'm, where I'm you know, very used to a very structured way of handling and managing data in, in, in a way that's very secure and privacy-centric, um, and I go to, now I'm playing in venture capital, I don't think I mentioned this when I was doing intros, but I'm a partner at Master's Fund, and now that I'm sort of digging into the venture capital space, there isn't a lot of um, discipline around data, data acquisition, data analysis, um, and I'm really excited to be able to leverage a lot of that, my learning from a lot of different other fields to build the kind of system that is going to make it easy for fund managers to really think about um, the hard analytics part of their investment. Obviously, in early venture, it's a lot in part due, I mean, the success is due to things that you can't really measure yet. For example, we look a lot at teachability of the entrepreneur, and that's right now something that you can't like leverage AI on. You would still depend on a human to be able to make a call about that. And then at some point, maybe you could standardize that capture and then you could be able to operate on it with AI. But right now that's not possible. And so there's a lot of spaces where we can play and get better. And that's really exciting. Whenever you get into spaces, basically you feel like you could do a lot of things that obviously is awesome. So um, I think the, the things that scare me directly that the things that excite me, which are that if we 
have a breakdown of our church institutions from elections to banks to in the different contexts. Um, you and then you have this sort of big, scary, potential unknown force of AI that you know there are plenty of you know, fairly credible new case scenarios around, and I think that are at least worth contemplating. When you bring those two realities together, that doesn't sound like a lot of fun. At the same time, I believe it's going to be a forcing factor for us to actually re re-architect the way that we interact with each other and transact and authenticate ourselves and all the other things that I touched on. And I think the outcomes of that are potentially incredibly benevolent. Like there are potentially uh, tremendous uh, forces for equity and equality that I can drive from equal access to information, equal ability to title your assets, equal ability to create and share content get compensated for that. And in a world where most of the world's wealth is here and we are being advertised to as the product of web two companies, we are very valuable for somebody in a part of the world where they don't have a lot of spending power as a consumer is, is less valuable. That changes as a content creator in a web three world where we all essentially, rather than being the product, are uh, participants in and in some sense co-owners of the product. And so I think that the move from web two to web three, which is not very much in the in zeitgeist right now, but I still believe it's gonna be a, it's gonna happen, it's gonna be a big deal, I think it be really benevolent. And I think it'll the the uh, demise of the web two models will be will be uh, ushered in by AI driving everything faster and the breakdown of institutions that um, that have been organized around uh number one. Number two, uh the Russia ex uh, experience and with centralization and back to cash um, is also very pleasant for me. My father-in-law literally two nights ago is in cartoon stand right now, and he carried back of cash to a uh, black market gas station to get diesel so he could the generator going in the middle of the civil war. Where he's got bullets coming through his window. Like, this is really real for people standing. Like, in my opinion, like, I'm the most privileged, you know, human out of the, you know, the 1% of the 1% and every other way that that, that touched me, even today. So, just the ability to transact is a huge deal. And I think that, yeah, it's going to be ushered in by some of these forces that feel scary, um, but that otherwise have a lot of staying power. And I think that the on the other side of that uh, are not just much more benevolent outcomes for the world. So um, I'm excited about that. And uh, I think finally for the people that are as privileged as me, while I may not carry back some cash to the gas station, I may not pay for my gas with Bitcoin anytime soon. On the other hand, I can imagine a lot of my time being freed up to be more creative and to spend more of my time learning rather than doing. Um, and I do think AI has the potential to create a great renaissance of, of freedom and creativity for those of us that are in that basically. So that's why. Question. Um, I think you're muted. You have to learn more about what you just talked about. <laughs> so, what do people do when they're beyond their depth? They uh, look to their friends and experts. So, I want my uh, friends meet Travis Moore. So Travis is another MIT person. He uh, He's right here. He's, I looked to him for all my AI, ML, robotics investments. And I'm curious to what Travis thinks. He's not hanging out with Elon this week, but he runs a space fabrication company in Kirkland and invited, invited him today. And I'd be curious to what he thinks uh, based on what's been shared so far. Thanks, Brian. Uh, Thanks for your insight. I got to sit with these folks at the, for lunch, but uh, my name is Travis Moore. I'm running an aerospace company, as Brian said. Uh, my passion is uh, health, which has kind of led me down the AI and ML uh, world. And I, I don't, I don't, honestly don't have a ton to add, but something I hadn't thought of a ton about, which y'all brought up quite poignantly, was just the trust factor. And so for me, I have a, an app that's a, it's a fitness app, it's called Core Sport, and it's essentially a, uh, a FICO score for your health, but it's a low tech solution. And I, I guess my question for you could be, uh, I've just recently started marketing my products, low tech solution to a high tech problem, but because of trust as it relates to new medicine development and financial investments, do you do you see any uh, growth or uh, rebound towards low tech solutions? Whether like you bought a, some purchase of land, are we going to see uh, a boomerang effect that because of the trust issues that people might go towards common exercise instead of bills or things like that, or buying land instead of buying uh, stocks? 
I think people will always be excited about new technology, and I don't think that's going to change. I mean, what, what, I mean, you know, my driver for going into hard assets was slightly different than just general investment. I mean, I wanted to build the next generation of entrepreneurs, and in order to do that, I have to build an entrepreneur training center, and so that required me to buy land. <laughs> um, but I mean, I, I do think, I mean, I, I think in general, people might shift away from public markets because right now it's very volatile. But it's not because necessarily of trust. It's more that you're not making money than you could be or you have been in the past. It's food entrepreneurs. Um, I don't know that. I mean, we've always distrusted I think, things in general, and that has never stopped people from investing in exciting things. And, oh, at least that's my view in the world. You know, true or. The same thing with the God feels around discussing in terms of you know face stuff. I actually don't think I mean there's no way of putting any kind of God wheels around the AI so that we don't uh, especially on something as specific as genomics so a drug discovery or something. Um, yeah, there's no way once you create something in the digital realm to authenticate it against things that are real, right? Unless there's some sort of blockchain tied to it, which <laughs> um, which is interesting because it happens unusually. Uh, so it's not realistic to be able to do that. You can do it by regulation, but again, like you can easily get around that. I, I actually think that if you have bad actors, you know, this is going to happen. There's no way to authenticate. I think, I think what Elon and a lot of things um, that came out in the last couple of weeks, they're essentially messages that we've got to be in our world when this technology is not going to be part of the world. We don't know what to do you now because I have a question that people are not in our world, so we can be excited for the kids and the kids, especially here in South Africa, the human program and the technology. Yeah, I mean, just last week, the chat in the beat kind of escaped into the wild, right? I mean, <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, I mean, I, I think that what you just alluded to, which is like, this is like the intersection of blockchain. Okay. So, I guess my question to you is could we, you know, could, let's say I was a, a newscaster. And I wanted to make sure that, you know, if people were watching me, they were able to do actually, like, could I have a unique, I don't know, I don't know, could I have a unique identifier, right, that was blockchain or affiliated or whatever, and, and could that, could it in effect, like, my neighbors certify that it was actually me, you know, and that was a credible source, and that maybe even I had you can tie reviews to that. I think. I'm just, just curious are so there some mm-hmm. that I can we use these intersecting industries to get smaller and kind of faith and what we need. Therefore, you can say that for good as opposed to, you know, for evil. Mm-hmm. It is being sort of said, except that we're real and aren't saying or stand up. Yeah, no, I haven't thought about it in the use case that you described, but we've thought about it in the use case of. You show up to the venue. How do we know that it's actually you and not somebody else without improving that with your ID and whatnot? And there's a concept that is a new concept that for those of us who've been in the industry, it's been in the works for a while called the soul bound token. The soul bound token means that you cannot transfer the code to anybody else that belongs to you. And you can accumulate certain data about yourself in that soul bound token. You can represent your name, your age, your credentials. What you've written with your journalist, you know, which where you graduated from, and the idea is that you carry that stuff and you give a reader, and you own it most importantly. You don't need to go to DMV. DMV doesn't own that data. You you own that data. There's a different use case also to think about is the idea of fact checking. Uh, as a journalist, you know, how do you know that what you're saying is actually true? And there's a lot of attempts now to decentralize the idea of fact checking. You know, uh, if there's just one centralized entity saying that something is true, as we've seen in the last few, few years in our politics, then you might not want to trust that centralized entity. But if it's decentralized and if it's cross verified and if these sources are compensated and the line of incentives is happening, 
and there's a lot of powerful environmental effects to, to, to these heteros infection. So to answer the practical part of your question, yes, technically it is possible. I think mean, practically it would be very hard because people don't hold value, potentially not value that as a product. Um, so, you know, I, I think the sort of the, the funding of that infrastructure would be really difficult. Did, uh, okay. Yeah, I I'm sorry, you can repeat that? Trust Project is a effort in San Francisco which has been working on truth in news. And they are actually coming up with a, they've been working on it before they are. And now they're working on it to authenticate how you can actually decide what fake news is. Just to have an ending point, who's the arm then? This is actually quite a Sally, uh, I'm losing her last name, but she's been running it, and a couple of folks in the new house and others have been coming up for a while. There's one comment to build on that and really important for you. So, Sam Altman from Open AI, his other project, which has so far gotten less attention, launched fairly contemporaneously with the Deputy Supporter, is Worldcoin, which is a cryptocurrency based project. Prove that you're a human to be able to prove things about yourself without revealing everything else about you as a human, pseudonymously for the graphic hashes, and to be able to transact in a global, you know, sort of fluid currency of sorts. So I don't think it's any accident that those two are being paired um, and being led by by Sam. So that use case, I think, and the use case that you alluded to, uh, Travis, relating to just provenance, like it's something. Did it come from a person and where did they come from and why? And I think those will be really, really fundamental. Um, we're very AI focused at this table. Um, my comment on the um, authentication I think about when I go to the airport and I use clear, and it's worth it to me to have given up the photograph of my eye redness or whatever they do, my, my pupils, because it gets me to the line faster. And if you want people to adopt authentication, it's make it worth their while. And, and I also think about the phones, do facial recognition, you know, to, to unlock. I think that there's some seminal technologies that could begin to solve that, that are solving in other ways, if it's worth the user's time to engage. Okay, I had a comment. You're just answering uh, Philip's question. There's a portfolio company that invests in Altessa where they're doing that for um, views and they can extend that to voice video, all that. Um, what I'll say is that um, it is going to be just on trace, like the Lipner AI, the Lipner solving things. I think the, the real mechanism to unlock that, that that industry is insurance. Think of uh, if you're Rihanna and somebody does a spoof on you saying you love Hitler, like that's a brand penalty, right? So you want to buy insurance to protect that brand and say, no, I'm the real authenticator, Rihanna. Here's my QYC, verify it. That's how this is. Rihanna will buy insurance to protect her brand to say, hey, when you. So if you an it, what's going to protect that? I mean, there's mechanisms for that, but I think insurance is the answer for this. Anyways, that was just a comment. And then I would say, you know, fundamentally, what we're talking about long term is the alignment problem. Is there a possibility for alignment under the, like, let's say, prime directive where, like, all life is precious? We work towards that. Has anybody gone through that kind of like thought experiment? I don't, I don't work at the edge of the eye, but I'm curious. I mean, I'm going to be long to say, and this is very philosophical now. So when we all like to say life is precious, like the way our economy works really makes a very clear point. Right. <laughs> so, I mean, that's long. So, okay, I don't know how to say this, but I mean, if you look at, so even if you look at actuarial science, for example, for every life, there is actually a dollar value. And that dollar value in the United States is actually very low, so it's six figure. And so if you, <laughs> and, and that only goes down from Western countries, right? I mean, in developed countries, that number is like six figures. Um, 
So there, you know, uh, yeah, that's a lot. I mean, I don't know how to sort of go. I mean, I obviously have a lot of data around this, but I don't want to like this to degrade into the whole like <laughs> So I have a question to understand how blockchain in particular can finally solve this problem of it. The world to describe it as like trust. And I totally get that we have a problem in some areas. We need the uh, authentication of quite a large number of people. Uh, but I see a structural problem here, and I want to get to help so I understand it. To get a large number of people to participate in authentication, you have to reward them. If you reward them, you need to have cryptocurrencies. Cryptocurrencies, silver currencies. Well, you have to have something. You have to have an A token, uh, which means that you have two problems here. One is the instability of the value of the token. Second, I need uh, computer intensive, uh, computer intensive resources, which is to me not only environmentally not right, but really the side is a highly elegant solution. Mm -hmm. So without having these two, you would have tokenless blockchains, which everyone would be used to do with the well. And without having some incentives, you really can't have a large system. The only system I know that actually has worked is Wikipedia, where people without incentives have gone in to work. It's a brilliant example of that. We really love that Wikipedia helps the video. Other than that, any other model of participation, the way it's been for a lot of other ones are missing. So, my question is how can this problem be solved in blockchain with the lies and tokens and some of the organization? So basically, what you said was tokenization is a bad thing. How do we do this without it? <laughs> and that's a very that's very that's a very common narrative that I hear. And uh, for clear reasons, I disagree with that, and I'll cover that in a second. One quick uh, point that I'd like to address, because it's also a misconception, is is it energy consumption. Um, Ethereum, which is the main uh, chain that is dominating the blockchain space, that moved away from proof of work to of sake, which means that it's no longer energy efficient. In fact, 99% uh, more efficient than it was before. So the energy consumption is no longer a concern. Um, and happy to go into more that, on that um, if you're interested. So the idea that tokens are bad. So <laughs> I've actually had a dinner yesterday with uh, a fellow fund manager here in Seattle, and we debated this topic quite a bit uh, because I think it's a good topic to debate. Ultimately, the way I see the value of, of, of blockchain in Web3 is the ability to recruit a decentralized network of service providers at scale very quickly. That is what Ethereum has done really well. This is what Bitcoin has done really well. Service providers to Ethereum used to be miners. I used to be a miner. I, I was mining Ethereum back in 2016 in my apartment in Seattle. I taught my mother in Russia how to mine Ethereum out of her apartment in, you know, in, in Moscow. So the power of decentralization and recruiting that network or workforce tool would only be possible with, with compensation, right? As you alluded to, you cannot, you would have, I would have not been mining Ethereum if I wasn't compensated. Now the question is, can you compensate me in something other than Ethereum tokens? Would I've done the work? Probably. You can compensate me in, you know, other tokens, not Ethereum tokens. If you are running a transaction for USDC, for example, which is a stable coin, you could have given me that. Maybe I would have done it if I trust USDC. Maybe I would have not. The the reason that I uh, that I think that the, the idea of Ethereum uh, worked is because everybody believed in the condition. Of Ethereum. So when I received Ethereum tokens, I believe that in 10 years, they're going to be worth a lot more than they're worth today. So not only am I getting compensated, I'm also investing, you know, investing in, the, in the future of, of this protocol. And I think this is the, the code that, that, that Ethereum, as the first example, was able to crack. And I don't think it's a bad thing. I think it's actually a pretty innovative idea. Um, and it's nothing to do with currency, per se. It has to do with the compensation and business model that's that's different than than it was before.
So I, I do want to sort of notate something that you said that was really interesting. Thank you so much, Kate. Um, so, um, you know, people think a lot about compensation in terms of like economic compensation, but there is something that humans all need, which is like some some sort of sense of purpose. And this is why Wikipedia kind of works. You don't get paid with good money, but you get paid with a sense that you've contributed to the greater body of knowledge of human humanity. And that's something that we haven't done a ton uh, to try to leverage is like people's desire to have purpose, how do you pay people with purpose? Right. Yeah, so the, the two things I'd say, and uh, I'll leave aside the tokenization, all that. I think at a minimum, an endogenous, the, uh, an, endo an endogenous economy around the token is problematic, like an algorithmic stable coin that isn't externally backed by something be a, an example of that. And so that, that could go off the rails quite quickly if that was your motivation for authenticating yourself and doing these things to try to invest trust. Um, I think it, an externally asset-backed form of compensation could work, but that's leaving it aside for a minute. Um, if you don't think that that's sufficient, I think there can be tremendous utility from your ability, as I've been saying multiple times, to transact. And if you need to be able to basically create a cryptographic hash of your identity and be able to use that to authenticate yourself to things, it'll become your new to, not just your two, your, your, your many factor authentication mechanism. So I believe there'll be tons of motivation to do that bit of work in order to be able to participate, frankly, in a, in a new mode of transacting for almost all things. The other thing is, again, back to your boomerang comments, um, I do think there's a, a strong hypothesis we'll come to value authenticity and providence and the ability to, to build up our own, you know, mutable ledger of things that we've done in the world as a person and be able to verify that that in fact was us. I think that'll have intrinsic value unto itself, increasingly just culturally and socially, regardless of whether it's actually compensated with any form of, of currency, cryptocurrency or otherwise. So I'm actually fairly optimistic the energy and other issues aside that will people will do the work that it will take to engage in these new ways and that blockchains at a minimum will be part of the authentication and verification part of it. Come join our 361 firm community of investors and thought leaders. We have a lot of events created by the community as we collaborate on investments and philanthropic interests. Join us.